21, Revelation chapter 21, verse 1. As you all might recall, at the great white throne judgment, uh, let me know when I'm out of bounds because I really don't know the boundaries here. At the great white throne judgment, we are standing as jury. And then we are the ones who judge the world and the fallen angels. And that is actually scriptural. This is not something I just say. I showed you 1 Corinthians chapter 6. A lot of people don't believe that. That's the reason why it is very important that you got to witness to your lost loved ones right now. Right. Because if you don't do that, I mean, can you picture yourself being jury over there, condemning your loved ones guilty when you are the ones who failed to witness to them? That's the reason why I taught you that one of the most important things in beginner's discipleship was actually soul winning. That was the first things that I taught you. And for those of you, um, it's probably the hardest thing, to be honest. The hardest thing is actually soul winning. Soul winning is probably the hardest thing for the beginning Christian. I know it was for me. I was terrified. I hated talking to people. And then the Lord, He used that nevertheless where it got me on fire and it changed my life. Some of you change your lives as soon as you passed out a track and talked to a soul how to do soul winning. And then you realized more and more the balance of how to minister to people and being more understanding of them and not be like a typical onliner in its own self world watching a bunch of random videos and then you come up with your own weird world. So I taught you not to end up like that. And then uh, onliners, I want them to understand that that's the reason why we came on uh, YouTube to try to help you train right, to grow right, to not be a typical onliner just messed up with a lot of bunch of videos who are not all in doctrinal agreement. So it is important to attend a Bible-believing church. We're going to stand as jury, as I mentioned to you before, and this judgment, the great white throne, is over. Now we're entering eternity here. So let's talk about eternity. What will take place over here is one of the most beautiful things you'll ever have. And we have saw beautiful things during the millennial reign of Christ. Now let's see what will happen during eternity. Verse 1 says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. No more sea. So notice over here that uh, there is no more sea. You might say, why is there no more sea? Remember, go back to Revelation chapter 4. What is that sea? I showed you that before, Revelation chapter 4. The sea is not a normal sea. In eternity, it's pretty much self-explanatory. John sees new heaven and then a new earth. Because the first earth and the first heaven passed away. So I'm going to draw the universe in this kind of shape. And again, the video, if some of you are curious, is the pyramid shape of the universe. I taught you that a long, long time ago. So I'm not going to do that right now, though. All right. But all of the universe over here, it changed into something new. Something new. First heaven, first earth. All the universe is gone. God replaces it. But then there's no more sea. Why? Because remember that sea of glass at Revelation chapter 4. Let's look at that over there. Revelation chapter 4. And then notice that at verse 2, immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven. Right? But look at verse 3. He that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. Then you'll notice at verse 6, and before the throne, so notice how the pictures matches up. Before the throne, there was a what? Sea of glass like unto crystal. Now, I'm not going to teach it here. I taught you that at Revelation 4. Remember, in the very top of the universe, see the top of the pyramid is heaven itself. So then the floor that divides heaven and the rest of the universe here is that sea of glass. Well, think about it. If this is what our current 
heaven and earth is in, and the sea of glass is over here, that dividing line, verse 1 says it passed away. So that's why it makes sense the sea of glass is gone, because the sea of glass is a part of this heaven and earth, the old heaven and earth that we're in. And God's replacing it with the new heaven and new earth. That sea of glass is gone. Why? Because now there's no dividing line with God's creation and His Amen. holy heaven. Everything is made holy and now there's unity. But that's why all the way back, like if you go way back at the Old Testament, that's why the Lord divided His people to avoid the corrupt nations. That's the reason why the Lord divided the sea of glass from His holy heaven to the rest of the universe. The only thing that can unify it is where uh, the church age were saved by the blood of Christ. So it didn't matter what ethnicity we, we are, we're all spiritually the same as God's children. That's one. Number two, at that new heaven, new earth, literally and physically, not just spiritually like today's Christians, literally and physically all will be one this time. So that's why the sea of glass will be gone. And then God's going to say, I'm going to be with you for eternity. That's the idea. That's a blessing. Now, new heaven, new earth, but there's also another thing that's new. Look at verse 2. And I, John, so that's John himself, right, the apostle, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem. He sees a, the holy city, New Jerusalem. This is not like the current Jerusalem that we've seen in the past Revelation chapters. Uh, the literal city of Jerusalem on the earth. This is not an earthly Jerusalem. This is a literal, this is a literal, physical, heavenly Jerusalem. Heavenly Jerusalem. Notice over here uh, that it says, I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven. So it's coming down out of heaven. This is a heavenly Jerusalem. Now, um, it comes out of heaven, this new Jerusalem. For now, I'm just going to draw new Jerusalem like this, okay? I'll explain why either in this Revelation study or our next Revelation study. Amen. So just put up with this for now, okay? So new Jerusalem, let's say that it's shaped like this. It comes... So remember, I'm trying to explain every word in the verse. That way you all can get a common sense, all right, of understanding every word over there. It comes down out of heaven. So this is a heavenly Jerusalem. This is not a typical earthly Jerusalem over there. And then we see three places in total. You see that? So there are three things that are new, three places. New heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem. Now go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And then we're going to look at the last verse over there. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And we'll be looking at the last verse. Now, throughout your entire Bible, entire Bible, you're going to find out there are three groups of people. Three groups of people throughout your entire Bible. Doesn't matter what dispensation you're at, you're actually going to notice these three that will pop out. Um, the third one obviously didn't pop out until uh, the ADs, the past 2,000 years. But then uh, throughout your entire Bible, you're going to see these three classes no matter what book you're at. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and then we'll read verse 32. Give none offense, neither to one group of people. They're called who? Jews. The second group of people, nor to the who? Gentiles. The third group of people, nor to the who? Church of God. Okay, so then there are three groups of people here. So then, Jews, whether they were saints during the Old Testament uh, or lost people, we see Jews. Second thing, Gentiles, whether they were Old Testament saints or whether they are unbelievers, they're still Gentile. Third one is Church of God. Now, just real briefly, I'm not going to really expound on all three because I'm not teaching a dispensational class. That's found in my other videos. But basically, see, with these two groups of people, God is looking at through physical lenses, right? So because he's looking at physical lenses, that's why he's judging them by their works of the flesh. 
Oh, that's why it makes sense that salvation was different that time. He's judging them by the works of their flesh. He's looking everything physically. But over here, he's looking everything spiritually. So it doesn't matter what work you do in your flesh, you don't count in God's eyes. If it's spiritual, he's seeing if he sees the work of his son done in your life. That's spiritual, Thank see? You. So notice over here that that's how it operates. That's how it operates. And if you know this foundation, it's going to be totally eye-opening in dispensationalism. Let me just say that. So I'm not going to expound on it, but the long, ver long version is that short. If you have these three as a foundation of different groups of people, then it's going to unlock a whole bunch of stuff in dispensationalism. Dispensationalism, for some of you who are not sure, just watch our video. Uh, we have a playlist of dispensationalism on YouTube. Just find that playlist and you'll have a whole bunch. But basically, dispensationalism is the right time period and what else? The right group of people. So if you have these three as your group of people, that's going to be intensely eye-opening. Understood? All right, but aside from that, if these are the three people that we see saved Jews, saved Gentiles, and then if you're in the church age, the past 2,000 years, then you're a Christian, the ch church. All right? So then, where do they go? So then, we got three places here. See that? One, two, three. One, two, three. So then, we find what's most appropriate. So through process of elimination and finding the best candidates, let's see which group, which group of people would be the best candidate for which place. All right, first of all, uh, it's a no-brainer, except some hyper-dispensationalists maybe, but the, if you have a brain, then it's common sense where your place is going to be when you look at Revelation 21. If you read verse 2, I saw the holy city knew what? Jerusalem. That's our home, all right? Some hyper-dispensationalists, I'm not saying all, but some of them believe that that's only a Jewish thing. That's not for Christians. You're wrong, okay? You go to the book of Galatians. It, uh, now, let me ask you this. Isn't Galatians uh, a, an epistle written by Paul? Galatians 4. Hyper-dispensationalists, they hype about Paul, our beloved Apostle Paul, our Apostle Paul, our Paul, our Paul. I mean, it's more than Jesus for some weird reason. So... Your beloved Apostle Paul, yeah. and yes, our, okay, he's our Apostle too. Look what he says about New Jerusalem. Look at this. Galatians chapter 4, verse 25. For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to who? Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with their children. But there's a contrast at verse 26. But Jerusalem, which is where? See, that's the heavenly Jerusalem. Does that match with Revelation 21.3, the above Jerusalem? Yes? Yes. Uh, the Jerusalem which is above is free, which is the what? Mother. Did he include himself here? Yes. This is written in which epistle? Galatians. This is not Matthew. We're not in the book of James or even the book of Hebrews. This is Galatians. Now, unless you're a hyper hyper, then you can try to divide that to a Jew, and some of them do. Some of them put the ridiculous notion of putting Romans 10 to a bunch of Jews, actually. That is wickedness. You've got to watch out for that attitude. Amen. These are doctrines that God specifically aimed for Christians to know and base upon. Someone to rob your blessing, that is a, that is a teacher that is not of God. Right, right. Trying to rob a blessing and a promise that's directed to you. All right. So that's a no-brainer. Now, go to the book of... Revelation 21 again. Now, we got the other two places. New heaven, new earth. Now, look, if they insist this is for Jews, then what about this one? Now, wouldn't Jews be most appropriate for this one? Look at Psalms 25. Psalms 25. Look at the book of Psalms, chapter 25. Think about it. Wouldn't Jews be the most appropriate for the earth? Why? Because remember, God promised them what kind of a kingdom. It's an earthly kingdom. Throughout your, I mean, uh, we don't have to turn to tons of verses, but if you're an honest Jewish reader of the Old Testament, there is no doubt that as you read that Bible, it's more of an earthly kingdom for, for Jews. Not, not really above. As a matter of fact, 
uh, if you read the whole Old Testament, you're going to see more about an earthly kingdom for Jews rather than up there, if you're going to be honest, right? If we talk about a kingdom up there, heaven, we see that mostly for Christians, read throughout New Testament, right? But throughout the Old Testament, we see mostly earthly kingdom, earthly kingdom, earthly kingdom. Why? Because those are for the Jews. Look at the book of Psalms, chapter 25. And then notice what the Word of God says at verse 22. Redeem which group of people? Israel, O God. Okay, so this is addressed to Israel. Is that correct? All right, if that's addressed to Israel, then notice what the Word of God says. When you go backwards over here, look at verse, uh, let's see, I just, uh, it's somewhere here in this chapter, uh, verse 9, there we go, verse 9, the meek will he guide in judgment, and the meek will he teach his way. Uh, just to throw, throw it out there, Matthew 5, he was speaking to Jews, right? He said, blessed are the who? Meek, for they shall what? Inherit the earth. Is that true? Well, look at verse 13. Verse 13. His soul shall dwell at ease and his seed, right? That's speaking to Jews. Church did not even exist that time. His seed shall what? Inherit the earth. All right, so we see the Jews. Now, that leaves new heaven for Gentiles. That makes sense. Go to uh, Deuteronomy 4. Deuteronomy 4. Now, I wonder if you read this in your Bible. Didn't you know that when God created the universe, that that was designed specifically for the nations, the nations around the world, those are Gentiles. I didn't know that. Well, uh, somebody has not been teaching you Bible. Look at Deuteronomy 4. See, that's why I encourage people to please attend a Bible-believing church. All right? You need a Bible-believing church where you can grow in grace. Let the Lord show you things. All right, we're going to look at Deuteronomy uh, chapter 4. Look at verse 19. Unless thou lift up thine eyes unto heaven, right? And when thou seest the sun and the moon and the stars, even all the host of heaven. See? So that's right here, the heaven, right? But look what God did. Shouldest be driven to worship them and serve them, which the Lord... So all this in the heaven, right? The stars, sun, and everything. The Lord did what? Thy God hath divided unto all nations under the whole heaven. Woo! Woo! How about that? Did you read that in your Bible? See, the Lord created all that universe for those nations, the Gentiles. Now, did God create the universe to be inhabited? Yes. Go to Isaiah 40. Isaiah 40. He created all those things in heaven so that it can be inhabited. Isaiah chapter 40, please. Verse 22, verse 22. Now, some people don't read this in their Bible. Now, look at Isaiah chapter 40 and then verse 22. Look what God says over here. The Bible says, It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers. Look at this. That stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain. See, heaven. Keep reading over here. And spreadeth them out as a what? Tent to what? Dwell in. Dwell in. It's made to be inhabited, to live in there. For who? Deuteronomy 4, the Lord created that universe for the Gentile nations over there. How about that? So then we see where the three people go over there. All right? All right, go back to Revelation 21. Revelation 21. This is going to be something throughout during eternity, right? Yeah. This is going to be basically a lot of fun, let's say. Amen. Revelation chapter 21. All right, let's continue on with the last half of verse 2. So then, New Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven. I explained that. Prepared as a bride adorned for a husband. So notice that this New Jerusalem is prepared like a bride for the husband. So that's the church. We are the bride of Christ. See? Right? So then that's... Certainly, New Jerusalem is for us. It's not something that's uh, for the nation of Israel, not for the Christian church. Then where are we going to go? I mean, hypers just rob every blessing from a Christian and just apply it to a Jew. And basically, you've got no blessing except your, our Apostle Paul. Like, that's your only piece you got in your mind, you know. 
So anyways, so we see over here that the church we have uh, New Jerusalem for ourselves because we are the bride of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, uh, being a true Bible-believing dispensationalist, we have to rightly divide verses. I don't deny that. The Apostle Paul, he is our apostle. There's no denying to that. We got to be careful of verses in the general epistles, the Old Testament, and the four Gospels, because not all those verses apply to us. But to simply think that you only have like uh, 12 epistles in your hand, and that's all the promise of a Christian, and then you, do, you think you can't find one single promise, I mean one single promise, in all the other books in the Bible, then you're nuts. Yeah. You are nuts. Amen. Then we're just wasting our time reading all the other books of the Bible, yeah. and we should only read the 12 epistles. That'll be smaller than the Book of Mormon, by the way. <laughs> all right. So our Christian Bible must be smaller than the Mormons, smaller than Muhammad's book? That's yeah. troubling to me. That's troubling to me. You will find Christian doctrine in those books of the Bible. And I'm talking about doctrinal verses. You can find them in Old Testament passages, uh, the four Gospels, and other books. Mainly the verses are Jews. We get that. So you have to be careful. But you will find some doctrinal verses for Christians too. And by the way, the application is not just doctrinal. You forgot a spiritual application as well. And Christians can get plenty of spiritual applications from any book of the Bible out there. All right, now let's look at... Uh, so now that I explained myself, that's a true dispensationalist is knowing how to divide verses. Not being lazy and say 12 for us and the rest for everybody. That's not a dispensationalist. You're not rightly dividing. Why did God say rightly dividing, not just dividing? Because he knows there's a wrongly dividing. So be careful of people who say that I'm a dispensationalist. That doesn't mean they're right. That doesn't mean they're right. 